God bless you. My name is Rosemary Santiago from On Wings of an Eagle. Today we're going to be speaking about the Passover lamb. And it's kind of like a dual sensation because at the same time, you know, the tragedy of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the Via Dolorosa, uh, the way of pain, uh, it also for us is a, a time of, of, uh, of happiness because at one time we were in sin and the Lord came to our lives to, to open up the way for reconciliation with his Father. So before anything, uh, I would like to present this, this uh, preaching that the Lord may glorify himself in your life, in my life. Believe me, today was like a real struggle, but I'm here and, and in my heart is that the word may be put out, that it may reach people, that people may change their attitude about who God the Father is. Because I know a lot of people, they label him, they think he's a tyrant, but it's not so. We're gonna find out that today. Father, I give you thanks, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the ability to be in my home and to be able to preach your word. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of your son for our lives. Because if it wasn't so, Lord, I wouldn't be here today. I ask you, Lord, that you may glorify yourself, that it may be simple, Lord, be able to be understood by everyone, no matter the age. I ask you, Lord, your guidance, your heart, and your mind. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Okay, we're going to start first with the original relationship that the Lord had with Adam and Eve. So we're going to read Genesis 2, 7 to 9. We'll skip to 15, 18, and then 21 to 23 and see what happened. Seven to nine. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We go next to 15 to 18. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And it says in 21 to 23, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Okay, let's dwell on this a little bit. Because you'll see um, Adam was had been placed a responsibility. He's the one that uh, was to lord over all living creatures. So we have to assume that he named 
the animals, he named the insects and whatever else the Lord had put before him. Uh, but, you know, God is a, uh, a father. He sees that all the animals have their mates, but he sees that Adam is alone. Adam needs someone, and you'll notice that Adam comes from the word Adama, which means taken out. It was like reddish. In some uh, definitions, they will say reddish, red. He came out of a type of clay. Uh, we all were made of dust. We go back to dust. We're created, and we go back to the dust. The only thing that remains that goes back to God is the spirit. The soul can either go to hell or can go to heaven. This is by our choice. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the relationship. Relationship that he had. Now everybody knows that Adam was formed first. And I was going to leave uh, certain scriptures for last, but I want you to understand um, the thought of God. He put responsibility like he does with the male of the house. They're supposed to be the overseers of the wife, of the children, to, to do what is expected him to do, just like the female. Female, the mother, uh, the wife, uh, she tends to her husband, she tends to her children, she tends to her home. But somewhere along the line, even though God had relationship with both of them, they didn't seem to really be in the same relationship. Because you have to question, why was Eve alone? Why was he in one place and she was in the other? She had called out to him. Now the law that was placed, the responsibility, the command was given to Adam. The Lord specifically told him here. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And this, because you have Satan. Satan, it just means adversary. He was uh, what the Bible classifies as Lucifer in English, in Spanish, Lucero, which is uh, a star. And um, apparently he was watching, he was observing this kind of thing, right? So she went into conversation. And one thing I always understood, this woman was not afraid when this serpent was used. Serpent apparently had legs. If it wasn't so, God would not curse it to go on its belly and drag himself, right? That's logical. So apparently they also had communication with the animals. Animals were able to communicate with Adam and Eve. So you will notice in the third, uh, this is uh, before the promise, where the Lord, uh, starting with seven and eight, says, And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now, I mean, he is God. He's all-knowing. Do you think that it was by chance that he happens to be in the garden? First of all, he walked through that garden. They had conversations. They had commun communion, uh, the three of them, the father with Adam and Eve. So they knew. Now, I, I questioned a little bit the fact where it says, and they knew that they were naked. They were always naked, but apparently... As soon as they went into the good 
and the evil, their eyes were open to the truth. They were always naked, but apparently some kind of a spiritual covering was there so that they could not even think about it, so that there would be no shame, so that they could constantly be in communion with the Father. But when they saw that they were naked, they knew, then fear came into them. And they hid themselves. Now, when you think about it, how do you hide yourself from God? God is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present. Pre so they make themselves uh, some aprons. So here, I'm going to read the, um, the sentence that God gives. It says here, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? By the way, from Adama, which is that, that, uh, that special clay, reddish clay, Adam uh, was given that name. But actually, Adam, uh, when they say man, man is not the male. Man is the human being so that's the reason why God called them both man not that they are men to men but they are male and female it says here and he said I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself and he said who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldn't eat? And look, instead of him saying, I am sorry, it's true, I, I disobeyed your command, you told me about it, but I, 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 I did it, it's my fault. Look at where excuses come in. This is where everybody starts accusing one, one to the other. It says, And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to, to me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Now he was told that he was not supposed to. He was supposed to ask. They were used to having different types of fruit. He didn't ask where that came from. That's number one. We always have to do this. We have to ask where things come from before we cherish and taste them and, and we find them delicious because there are many things that appear to be good and they are not. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me. First he says, the woman you gave me. Now she says, the serpent. I'm more than sure that they knew because here, this is what she says. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in midst of the garden, God had said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now I'm not sure, uh, because I wasn't there, I can't say, oh, she exaggerated. He only said that you, you shouldn't eat from it. Never did the word of God show. It says it in here. If she said it, that's probably, it's a consequence. Because the strange thing is, I take this. To be able to use it, I have to take it. My hand, got to open it, and then I use it. If she didn't touch it, if she would have said no first in her mind and not even approach the tree, she, she wouldn't have a, any problem. 
because according to here, it says in 2.9, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. So it wasn't something that looked different to her. She had all kinds of fruits that she could have eaten. So did Adam. And it was pleasant to the sight. So you have to question, what was it that stood out in her mind? And it said that he approached her and said, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Which in a way, if you think about it, that is the truth. It became the truth afterwards. But that is the sentence. And we are going to see how God responds to their sin. Because you have people that have this terrible way of describing God. And then he's sovereign. So you want him to stop being sovereign. And so that you and I could become sovereign and tell God how he has to do his things when he's the designer and the creator of all humanity and all creation, all that is natural, even the supernatural. Here it says, And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of, of thy life. There's the uh, literal, the, I think he's called a uh, rehem. And that's the difference when they're talking about Satan himself as the serpent that took upon himself. You know, he went in to the serpent to be able to be very cunning, very subtle, and have that conversation with her. And now, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now he's talking to Satan. And who is Satan's seed? A lot of people saying it's because of the mixture of the fallen angels. Any seed, anybody that comes out, we are called seeds of the Lord because, because of his death and resurrection. We come to the knowing. We accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be thy husband. And he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow. Shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles. You, 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 you plant, and, and instead of it being where it gives forth, where it does everything it's supposed to be doing, because you did what you did. And you know something? We're still seeing that today. Because of sin, because of what man is doing, uh, humankind, because of the sin, we affect earth. We affect the ground. We affect uh, the way nature is. We affect a uh, bio uh, system. We affect uh, the, the, the air. We, we affect everything because we choose to do sin. Okay, let me, let me read, let me read um, 1 Corinthians so you can see uh, what it says, how, how we can appreciate it. It says 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 21 20 to 26. 21 
to 26 says, For since by man come death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And then we have in 51 to 56, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised in incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, talking about us, right? The flesh. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So now we have the first uh, Adam that sinned, and now we have, and we're talking about little by little, that is the reason why I called it the Passover lamb. That was the original relationship. Now what happens? Let's see what happens um, in chapter 3, 21. This was afterwards, and we're going to see what takes place in, in uh, number 2, which will be the sacrificed lamb. Let's see, 3, 21, it says, Unto Adam also and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them? Now you have to understand, uh, because we talk about a Passover, but if you think about it, the, the first Passover, passing over, where death will pass over, we first receive chapter 315, which is the promise of the Savior. He is life. Then we are seeing how God himself clothes them. So you have to ask yourself, how, how, where did that cloth come from? He doesn't have a magic wand. But there were animals already formed by God. You see all chapter 1 and chapter 2. So the clothing, first the covering of the promise of a Savior, and he says to Satan, okay, you're going to hurt him in his heel, which if we look into uh, the reality of, his, of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, the nails were put through the heel. But you know, the idea of the second Adam, where we enjoy 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, where was the victory of death was when the Lord Jesus Christ literally in the spirit world crushed the thought of Satan. You will see through the history, he tried to get rid of that promise. Started with Moses. He didn't know for sure uh, who the, the Messiah, the Savior was. That was a secret. That was left from the very beginning before anybody was formed on earth. So he kills to cover 
this so-called uh, uh, tyrant gives them a promise, then covers them, the nakedness. First, all these things took place before they were casted out. And you'll see why it was necessary to be casted out. Because we never, uh, we, you know, we need repetition. We forget things. Look at this. It says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life. What is he saying? If we leave him in here, he's going to end up, if he did it the first time, the second time it's going to be that much easier because when we first sin in the second and the third, it becomes so easy for us to sin. So he says, look, I got to get these two out. They're going to end up taking it. Then they will have no forgiveness, no redemption for them. They will be forever, eternally in their sin. So he approaches them this way. He says, therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden. And I would like for you to see Adam and Eve being casted out. I mean, they weren't casted out for being good. They were, they were casted out for their own good. They had already sinned. And God is so merciful that he pronounces a promise, starting with them all the way to when, until the Lord Jesus Christ comes, because there is going to be a rapture. There are events that have already taken place, and we are in the latter times. There are no excuses. So he drove out the man he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden, cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. It was for their own good because would they have eaten of that tree of life they would have sentenced themselves forever okay let us see what an actual sacrifice looks like the actual sacrifice if you see uh, they they cut and the pouring of the blood has to be of a certain way let's see why that was necessary let's go to Exodus Exodus chapter 12 let's go to 5 I'm going to be explaining certain things I'm also going to be going Old Testament, Fulfillment, New Testament, so that you can understand that this is not by coincidence, that this was not just to write a novel, that the Word of God is exactly, it has the reason to be why He asked for certain things, why think certain things had to be fulfilled, and now we are in the latter times, right? So we have the actual sacrifice and we have Exodus chapter 12, 5. We all know that originally they were in Egypt and they were in Egypt and it specifically says that they were in Egypt 430 years. We use the word, uh, the, uh, the, the number 400 like as a whole, but 30 years more had passed so that um, we read the plagues and we think it was like one day to, to another and then we see uh, an expression like and he hardened the heart of Pharaoh but Pharaoh hardened his heart first and God what what it really means is that that he gave him time to think and time he didn't respond 
The next thing comes in, he becomes harder. And he says, okay, now I'm going to do this. You know why? Uh, God gives time for people. How much time do we need? Uh, we are in 2018. Why are the years being counted? 2018 means what? Just something that passes by? Because it's exactly 2018 years where our Lord Jesus Christ became the Passover lamb. It was to save you and I from our sins. Okay, I'm going to have to be going like, almost like flying because these things are very detailed. So 12.5, it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Now, let's go to Isaiah, Isaiah 53. A lot of people overlook being of the uh, same background as uh, Jesus Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach was uh, born in, in Israel. He is not from the United States. He's not from Rome. He was born in Israel. And for many years... His own rejected him. But guess what? The Christians are not doing their job. And it says, in fact, he spoke to his people and he said that with the Gentiles, he was going to create jealousy, you know, because he was going to deal with them. But guess what? Because we are not doing our job. We are not preaching the word of God. We are not talking about what we're supposed to be talking about. The Lord now will be creating jealousy with the Jews because there are youth that are being raised. They are speaking among their own. They are preaching about Yeshua HaMashiach. How's that for you? Amazing, right? Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her sharers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. That word is where there's no iniquity in him. The word is mirma. It means there's no deceit. God tells you like it is. Whether he explains to you, this is what I'm going to do. If you do my will, he also explains to you, this is what's going to happen if you don't. The truth. His son said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's why we're talking about the Passover lamb. Not because of a festival. Not because of a holiday. And by the way, this whole week, we're not preparing Easter because Easter comes from Asterisk and that's a pagan holiday. It does not glorify God. It does not glorify the sin sacrifice. And that's something that we have to think about. Let's go to um, 12.6 of Exodus. As we're going along, I'll be shifting back and forth to the, uh, to the New Testament. It says, And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And we have to look inside and see the evenings because they're really afternoons. Let's look at Matthew 27, 45. Matthew 27, 45. Twenty-seven, forty-five. It says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. That's from 12 to 3. So isn't that so amazing how the perfect lamb 
Exodus. I'm going too far back. Exodus. It says, And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So, talking about the afternoons. Okay. Let's go to Isaiah 56. Let's see what they did to the Savior. Isaiah chapter 56. It says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Let's go to Micah. Micah chapter 5. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. Be hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. So you think that this is all by chance, by coincidence, and it's all in the scripture. So now let's go to Isaiah 52 and see what it says. Chapter 52, verse 14. As many were astonished, they were astonished, they were amazed at thee. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Then, when you, when you read something like this, you can understand better when we read in chapter 53. It says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form, no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Does that not tell you right okay so let's go briefly Matthew 27 27 26 and it says then release he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Let's go to Mark 15, 15. Mark 15, 15. And so Pilate willingly content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Luke 18. Thirty-one to thirty-three. Then he took unto him the twelve. I'm sorry. Thirty-one. 18, 31 to 33. Oh, okay, okay, yes. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And we also have to uh, question about the days because it's not uh, counted. A day is not counted from morning to night. A day is counted from one day to another. So three days are very literal. And the feast day is very strict. 
So we have to know exactly when the women went, even though it says it was in the first day, uh, they had to complete seven days of that feast. Okay. Let's see what was done with that Passover lamb to the next would be the two men in Passover. They were instructed. Where does the word Passover come from? Let's see what it says. Exodus 12, 23 and 27. 12, 23 and 27. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood of upon the lintel and on the two side posts the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you let's see what it says 27 that ye shall say and this is what they have to tell their generation that ye shall say it is the sacrifice of the lord's passover who passed over the houses of the children of israel in egypt when he smote the egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worshiped and the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. Okay. Let's see the illustration of the firstborn of the servant. Unfortunately, and this happens in all our life, Innocent people pay consequences because of somebody else's uh, foolishness. This is the reason why even that of nature, the things that we're eating, the things that, that, that help cross-pollination, they're dying out because of our sins, because of our foolishness. Look what happened. This is what took place. And it came to pass that at midnight, the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Now he started with his son. But what a lot of people don't know, and in a lot of the movies they make it look very, you know, very dramatic. And at the end they show Pharaoh with his queen at his side and he's angry because he lost his son. Pharaoh died with the troop that went after the very last thing God was going to not only uh, destroy them, but he was going to destroy the pride of Egypt. That's why you go to Egypt. There's nothing pretty about Egypt anymore. Sphinxes, they look like somebody punched their face. They have all that knocked out. Arid, where it used to be one of the most beautiful places, Fertile Crescent and everything like that. Let me tell you, when God comes into the issue, when people don't listen, God has to see himself do things that he does not like. He does not like the idea. Let's see uh, number seven, Jesus carries the cross. I want you to see this. Um... You know, a lot of people are what we call in Spanish tomando pong. You know when you when when somebody gives you a ride, then once you're in there, you want to take the steering wheel, right? He paid that price. And a lot of people think grace, they're always splurging grace. They're always talking about grace. 
grace does not give you and me uh, the license to sin. He paid the price, so we're going to keep sinning. It doesn't work that way. The Lord said, whoever wants to follow me has to deny oneself. He's got to carry his cross every day and follow him. Too many people think that um, this here is uh, equal in equation to I can do my thing. I can have a lot of stuff. You know, lots of mansion, lots of car, lots of money. That's not what it's all about. He says that, that that's, that's a secondary thing. We have to seek God and his righteousness and all the other things will be added on. Do you notice that there is such a radical change here in our life, here in the United States, because of some people that are hidden away, that have their little utopia at our expense. They're trying to get rid of, whereas it says in the word, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. There shall not perish. It's not saying that you're not going to die. A lot of us are going to die. A lot of us are going to die because of the events that are going to take place. Nobody wants to listen to the Word of God. The Word of God is delicious. The Word of God preserves. Not too long ago, a couple of days ago, I received a message that I wish I never had to hear someone that I knew for so long. We used to visit that person, visit the family, very soft-spoken person, but he had done something he shouldn't have and something about sin, it, it becomes easier. That's why we need the word of God. We need to relate with the father. We need to talk to him. We need to express uh, what hurts us, what bothers us, what gets us angry, uh, what, 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 what makes us happy. He, he's a person. He's real. I don't see him, but I feel him. He speaks to me. He directs me. He guides me through his Holy Spirit. So the... What I received, I wish I'd never heard. This man, after whatever it was that he had done the first time, opened up a big door, he did something else. The sentence that they gave him was too big for him. But God is bigger than all our problems. That's the reason why God gave his only begotten son. He went home. He took poison. They found him dead. Do you know that once you take your own life, once you are no longer here, you have no other opportunity. God is an eternal God. Heaven is eternal. Hell is eternal. A lot of people have been led by the Lord for them to visualize what it's all about so that they can come back and they can talk. That's the reason why Jesus died to prevent things like that, to know that he died so, he, so you can talk to the father. He wanted to reconcile us with his father. I'm hurt about that news. I don't know if I'll ever get over it. But I, I don't get over the, the news I hear every single day. Babies being uh, raped, used, abused, elderly people. Those things hurt. The message of the Lord is saying, I'm time. I'm here. I sent my son. I promised from the very beginning. I'm keeping my promise. I brought my son. I made him sin like if he was the one that, that had sinned. And God is giving this opportunity. 
There are a lot of people out there that are planning on taking their own lives. If you get to hear this, if God touches you to hear this, I want you to really pay attention. Because you suffer so much here and people have hurt you while they go to sleep. You're still in trouble. You have a lot of pain. Take that pain. Give it over to the Father. He already, he already made that reconciliation plan from the very beginning. I have one more scripture that I would like to read. Let me see if I could find this. So I had it in, um, written down and it says, Like right now, my, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, touched, but it speaks of that it was the very beginning. From, from the very beginning, God decided that he was going to, to become that Passover lamb. When, when John the Baptist called him out, he said, there's the Passover lamb. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He hadn't died yet and he was already prophesying his death. Why should you die every single day with whatever was done to you when, when you were a child, when you were a youth? Mother, father, sister, brother, pastors, leaders. Give yourself over to the Lord. Give him a chance. He was looking at you. He was looking at me when he was on that cross. Many people that have gone there to see, to come back to talk, the Lord would be weeping. Those people would be yelling out. People who knew the Lord, people who were pastors, people who were just Christians. And they be pleading, and the tears are coming down. He says, I can't do nothing. I already did what I had to do. Passover is not just a holiday. It's not a ritual of all this and going through this and going through that. It has to do with his son. He became our cross. He stretched out his hands. He became sin. You and I would have been straight in hell if it wasn't for that sacrifice. And all we have to do is something so simple. All we got to do is ask for forgiveness. Ask for God to have his Holy Spirit to guide you every single day. In August, I have served the Lord for 44 years, not by myself, but I look for the Father. I developed a relationship with him. I can feel the pain of the Holy Spirit because he looks on his creations. And there's so many of them are dying without their salvation. And the biggest pain of all is that people that know the Lord and those right now having the gift to preach the word of God. Look, we don't have anything expensive in this house to be able to have this video put out. I said to the Lord, well, how am I going to be a missionary? Where am I going to, you know, have the money to travel, to go to those places? So he made me one in my own home with my own infirmities. It's a lot of things that he took from me, but there's certain things I'm struggling with. This is my cross that I'm carrying. God doesn't stop being God because I'm in pain. But 
He gives me the strength through my pain. This morning, I had to pull myself out of that bed, scrape myself from the pains that I feel. Can't take anything for it. I have to put up with this every single day. But he helps me carry my cross. I don't do these things all by myself. So I would like to invite you. This is a very special week. This is a time that God has allowed for you to kind of introspect. I invite you. Just repeat these words. They're very simple. God doesn't want a $25 word. Here we have the Passover lamb, the real Passover lamb. Remember I spoke to you about those men that put the blood, the Passover. Well, there's your last one, the post. That's Yeshua. He became, he is the Passover lamb. He was designed from the very beginning from his father to give you this opportunity. And now I invite you to be part of him. We become the body of Christ. We become one with him. We become spiritual beings. We become different. We get the strength to go on and to be able to preach the word of God. So please follow these words. God, I know this is a special time for a lot of people. And it seems to be almost a perfect week, Lord, because people forget that your son had died for us. So I come to you and I ask for forgiveness. I ask that that sin sacrifice not cover me, but cleanse me of my sin. That your Holy Spirit may guide me every single day. And that you may write my name in the book of life. I truly am sorry for my sins. I do ask for forgiveness. I ask you these things in Jesus' mighty name. Simple, right? Very simple. Now let me say a prayer. Father, I give you thanks first of all. I was able to come and I was able to say, Lord, what I felt was your heart today. I ask you, Lord, that you may glorify yourself. Help them in their struggles, Father. Help them and heal them spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, and socially, in Jesus' mighty name. This has been Rosemary Santiago from On Wings of an Eagle. I invite you to uh, ask the Lord, the Holy Spirit, uh, to guide you to a church that preaches the word exactly the way it is. It was inspired by his Holy Spirit from Genesis all the way to Revelation. God bless you.